Objective one is all about attentional biases. And this, when I, when I began learning about attentional biases, it became clear to me that this for myself was the core of a lot of the problems that I was facing. So it's kind of like at the heart of the issues that I had on a regular basis. And it's common, right? It is common for human beings to have difficulty attending to all the appropriate variables because there is so much information. Our world is so complex. The information, the problems that we're trying to solve are complex. The information coming to us is very complex. And it's difficult to try to, it's difficult to pay attention to all of the, all of the variables that are coming in and all of that information, integrate all of that information into our decision-making process. But what happens is that if we are not attending to the right things when we're making decisions, it is very likely that we are going to lose valuable resources that, in, that include time, energy, money, and social capital. And it, you know, money is a valuable resource, but time, energy, and social capital are the threads and the fabric that keep all of this together. They, those are the true resources, right? Money is a symbolic representation of a resource. It is not necessarily a resource in and of itself. It represents a resource. And so, you know, that, that saying time is money, like you are, money is just a representation of time or energy or something else. Um, but no matter what, if you're not paying attention to the right variables, you are going to lose resources or not be maximally effective. So the goal is to learn how to pay better attention. And obviously that's easier said than done. Most of the time, what we're responding to is the most salient information. So that the most emotionally salient information, the information that comes in and that draws our attention to it. And if we're only paying attention to the information that is drawing our attention, it is likely that we're going to miss the under, underlying information, which is potentially and most likely impacting the situation more, but we're not necessarily looking there. So the saying, the, sque the squeaky wheel gets the grease is just is a perfect um, saying for this cognitive bi bias of surrogation because it is the, it's the thing, the squeaky wheel that gets our attention and it is that immediate response to that salient information that generally gets done that that generally gets done and so you know if in your mind squeaky wheel means wheel needs grease those that um decision is going to be a readily accessible one that you are more likely to enact upon right away without you know without hesitation without response without delay however if you're not looking more deeply at the problem it's likely that you're going to miss information and in this kind of analogy for or you know this illustration what we need to remember is that just because a wheel is squeaking doesn't mean that it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs grease. We need to look a little bit deeper or sometimes a lot deeper to identify 
the core cause, the root cause of that problem. Because maybe this week isn't because it just needs a little grease to move more smoothly. Maybe the wheel is squeaking because the bearings are rusting out and the wheel is about to fall off. So there potentially is a different problem that we're not attuned to and a different, and we're applying a, a solution to a problem that, that doesn't exist. But we think that, that problem exists because we, we are attending to the red flag or the squeak as opposed to what we can actually see, observe, and measure. Behaviorally, we value more greatly those things that are in our immediate environment and the things that we can get access to quickly and easily and right away. So the, the here and now, right, the things that we can get here now are more valuable than the things that we might get later. And evolutionarily, this is an, an important way or an adaptive way to respond to our environments because the future wasn't always um, guaranteed. The future is never guaranteed, but now in our society and in this day and age, there is, you know, we're living longer, there's technology which is creating an environment in which we can expect that you know we will make it to that later date at which time we'll have access to higher levels of reinforcement um but we we continue to have this this urge to do things that will get us immediate reinforcements and to avoid or just not you know not do those things that are going to lead to delayed reinforcement and so to address this, to overcome this bias that we get pulled into is to commit to investing in our future, Com you know, commit to investing time, energy, and resources into those long-term outcomes, um, even though we you know, we're kind of conditioned or we're, we've evolved to value the, the things that are going, that can happen now versus things that are going to happen later. Um, if we proactively and intentionally invest in the future, then we can help, we can overcome that barrier. We've all kind of fallen into the trap of feeling as though, thinking as though it's better to do nothing. Uh, because sometimes acting is the, the thought of acting, the actual physical, the physicality, the resources necessary for doing what needs to be done is hard. And there are risks associated with taking action. But many times the risks of not acting are much greater than the risks of acting in and of themselves. Because what generally tends to happen if we're not acting is that our problems are growing bigger and bigger and um, becoming, getting, they get to a point where they're not impossible to handle because I don't believe that any problem is, is impossible to handle, but it gets more complex or it's going to take more resources later because the problem has grown as opposed to if we had dealt with things as they happen, then the resources necessary to address the problem wouldn't have been so great. Many times when we're focused on when, okay, so we don't want to, we don't want to address those you know, those problems which are going to take a lot of resources. And so we end up bike shedding and focusing on more trivial, trivial issues. And again, when you're focusing on the more trivial issues, first of all, you are diverting resources from 
more complex problems to more trivial things that don't that aren't necessarily going to matter in the long run. And when you're focused on more trivial issues, you are generally ignoring more complex issues. And if we ignore more complex issues chronically, then they tend to compound over time and get worse, get more complex and more convoluted, which are which those things are going to lead to much greater difficulty in handling things, as opposed to if we had simply invested 10 to 20% of our resources into working on the problems that we have and creating solutions um, and enacting solutions in a, in a stepwise or systematic manner. <clears throat> Commonly, um, what we, you know, again, this comes down to, you know, evolutionarily, but also culturally shaped behaviors um, when it comes to valuing or overvaluing outcomes over the process. And so, you know, we, if we get the deal or we get the grade or we get the job or, you know, some, whatever it is, we we achieve the ultimate outcome, that is generally what is attended to and reinforced most strongly is the actual, is when the outcome has been highly positive. But what can happen as a result of that, if we're hyper-focused, overly focused on outcome measures as, oppo as opposed to process measures, then we can cause the creation of, a, of an environment in which we are actually inhibiting innovation and inhibiting action because the behaviors that get shaped up are only like it's only valuable if what I'm going to do is going to work and it's going to be successful only that then and only then is it worth it but what you know the environment and the clone culture that we want that we should be creating is a culture in which we are um, reinforcing and appreciating the process and how we came to a solution as opposed to just you know simply looking at the outcome if it ended up working out great um, but it doesn't discount but even if it doesn't that's okay too because we learned something and we 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 tried we took action we we were thoughtful and we took the steps necessary to try to, to try to solve the problem. And even though it wasn't perfect this time, we learned something about how we could um, potentially solve problems in the future. The last bias that is kind of encapsulated in the, this kind of this group of biases around attention, attention or lack thereof is what is called survivorship bias. And again, these problems begin, these problems happen when we have information coming into us and that information is very salient and the assumption can be made that the information that we have received is all the information that is available to be received but the problem is that that is generally not the case. We don't have all of the information. And so we need to be tuned into and learn the skills necessary to evaluate and consider the bigger picture and what information might be missing and ask questions in order to seek and gather more information than we already have to make sure that we have all of the relevant variables in our kind of in our scope of understanding 
so we can make more informed decisions, which, what the, which is what this is really all about. When we are in our autopilot systems and we are only responding to the most salient information and we're reflexively responding to our environments, that generally means that we're not thinking through all of our decisions, we're not gathering all of the relevant information, and we're not making informed decisions. One of the things in my own personal practice, especially when it came when it comes to parent training, that I really tried to convey and teach and um, influence others to kind of embody this way of thinking as well is that really to me the power of <coughs> applied behavioral science is this idea that we can take a step back and remove the emotionality from decision making from the decision making process gather all of the relevant information and truly make an informed decision based on objective information, observable, measurable changes. Those are the things to which we are responding as opposed to simply that gut feeling or the gut reaction, which is really why I connected so deeply with this book um, was because for me, it provided that extra key piece of information and context in which that was important for, for me to kind of put this understanding in, um, into play into my life and evaluate my own personal decisions and how they've been impacted. So the exercise for this objective is to um, consider a, a situation in which made, you made a poor decision because you were not attending to all the relevant variables and to think about what you could have done differently um, to prevent those problems. <clears throat> so in my, in my life, as I've talked about and mentioned frequently is this idea that the attention, attentional biases are the ones that when I learned about them and reflected upon my own life, that those were the ones that I connected most deeply with and was like, yes, <laughs> that is my problem. I do not attend to all the relevant variables and I you know, just make, make decisions without gathering all the information because I think I got it. I got it. I got this. Don't worry about it. I got it. And, um, and so the, this is, these are the skills that I have to work constantly to develop and the behavior patterns that I need to um, focus the most on in my own personal and professional development. So throughout my history, I, I, you know, I haven't always paid attention to all the relevant variables. I have a, I have a history of psychological inflexibility, as many of us do, um, in that it, you know, it has been historically difficult for me to remain grounded in the present moment and stay focused and attend to everything that's going on around me and really get out of my head because I spend a lot of time kind of just, you know, in my head, thinking, planning, organizing, um, and, you know, kind of in that more cognitive space as opposed to the um, socially and emotionally intelligent space where I'm able to um, listen and watch and observe and communicate and talk and gather information in a more flexible way in a more socially responsive way. Um, and it's more focused on me and my perspective and what's going on in my life. And, um, you know, a lot of that inflexibility that kind of kept, kept me um, kind of looped 
into those negative thought and action patterns. But as I have as I have learned to remain more grounded in the present moment, as I have learned to accept and learn from the pain that I have from my history, as opposed to trying to fight it and push it away and get rid of it because it's bad, and as I have learned to diffuse those negative thought and action patterns and realize that you know thoughts are just thoughts and they don't they don't control the outcome, it's become a lot easier. Um, for me to you know, turn off the automatic pilot system and really switch into more of what I would consider an intentional cruise control system, right? Where it's, you know, I don't have, like I'm not using all of my resources or like forward momentum isn't, isn't dependent on all, the utilization of all of my resources, but I am, I do have, some of my resources, my attentional resources are focused on what's going on in the here and now. And when I notice myself kind of going off into thought and kind of, and um, disconnecting from the here and now and disconnecting from um, kind of what is present in the environment that needs to be perceived, that needs to be you know, um, like received and integrated into the bigger picture. Um, I can more readily access that area and kind of in this um, way of being in my life. <laughs> but it, is, it, it takes a lot of effort, or it has taken a lot of effort to develop those skills to the point where I now feel much more able to you know, rein it in, rein my attention in to what is going on in the here and now. And I really think that this is applicable to not only ourselves, but to all of those people who are around us because there is so much stimulation in our environment. So many stimuli are coming into our systems at all times that it makes it difficult to sometimes to filter out the, you know, filter out those um, inputs and focus in on and hone in on what is the most important, not the most emotionally salient, but the, um, but the most um, contextually relevant information that needs to be, that needs to be attended to. Um, but if we all work, if we can all work together to get to the point where when we're in an environment, each individual within that environment is fully within that environment and invested in what is happening, um, that's when you know, the most effective action can take place. That is, where, that is the place in which more um, peace can be fostered and facilitated and grown and developed. <laughs>